It is time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. CTV News reported yesterday that a four-year-old with Down syndrome spent 40 hours in the ER of Cortellucci Vaughan Hospital before she was finally transferred to a bed. The child's mother, Jasmine, was forced to create a makeshift bed out of chairs for her exhausted and sick daughter, who was suffering with a fever, vomiting, and had low oxygen levels. Speaker, our youngest children are sick and suffering because this government didn't do enough to prepare for this crisis. I ask the Premier, how many more kids will have to wait long hours for care before this government takes action to relieve the burden on hospitals and ensure our kids get the care that they need? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, it is obviously deeply disturbing for all of us to hear stories about parents who have to wait with their children as they get admitted, as they are waiting for that bed to open up in the hospitals. But I also think it's important for us to understand and appreciate that these are not new issues and not new problems. We were left, frankly, with a health system that was in dire need of investments. Our government has made those investments. We continue to make those investments. We are the first government since the last previous Conservative government to open up two new medical schools in the province of Ontario. We will continue to do what is right and what is needed. But yes, I do find it disturbing when we hear stories about how parents have to wait for that bed to become available Spons? and the child to ultimately be in, an, in a uh, hospital room. Thank you. A supplementary question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker, again to the Premier. We also heard yesterday that Children's Hospital at London Health Sciences Centre announced the heartbreaking decision to cancel surgeries for sick children. Inpatient bed occupancy is higher than any other time during the pandemic, despite the hospital's efforts to expand capacity and to move children to the adult ICU. The Director of Pediatric Critical Care says the crisis is getting worse every day and they don't know how long the cancellations will last. Speaker, we've been hearing that this government has a plan for the crisis in our, in our pediatric hospitals. How can the Premier possibly defend a plan that causes sick children and their families to suffer? Thank you, Speaker. I've said it before and I will say it again. Status quo isn't working. We have put in place with our partners, including Ontario Health, constant contact with pediatric hospitals, Ontario Health, primary care pr practitioners, um, community health centres to make sure that everyone is working at full capacity so that we have access to the, the care we need. I understand this is very challenging. When we see these surges, when we see increases in viruses such as RSV, when we see increases in influenza, what I would ask respectfully is that all of us make sure we are part of the solution by encouraging our constituents to get that flu vaccine. If you haven't yet received your booster shot for COVID-19, do it. That will make a difference Response. in our hospitals, in our primary care uh, facilities, and ultimately protect our children. Thank you. The final supplementary, Member Philanima. Uh, speaker, one of the sick children who is suffering is a two-year-old girl diagnosed with tuberous sclerosis complex two at the age of six months. She experiences up to five seizures a day, which could delay her development. Her parents have been waiting since April for a five-day, four-night-long EEG at London's Children's Hospital to determine the best treatment options. The procedure was finally scheduled uh, for last week, but her parents have now been told that it will be postponed in indefinitely. Speaker, this government's so-called plan is devastating for families like my constituents. Why did the Premier fail to provide the supports and resources needed by Children's Hospital and other pediatric hospitals to prevent surgeries and procedures from being cancelled? Speaker, we did and we are 
Now, we prepared for this, this uh, surge. We understood, we worked with Ontario Health to make sure that all pediatric and, in fact, all hospitals had plans in place for a surge that could have come in the fall session. We are now seeing that. As I said, our best defense is to make sure that people get that flu vaccine, that we have uh, sufficient um, investments in place at pediatric hospitals and, frankly, in community hospitals. You know, I want to highlight some of the uh, partnerships that have happened. We often talk about the highly skilled, exceptional workers that are in our pediatric hospitals, but we also have highly skilled, caring, compassionate uh, health care workers in our community hospitals. And now we have partnerships where sick kids Response. nurses are training community hospital nurses on what to expect and how to deal with patients with, for example, RSB. It's working. We will continue to do that work. Next question, leader the opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, uh, to the Premier. In high school civics, students learn that majority rule is essential to democracy. Majority rule. But with Bill 39, the Premier is handing Mayor Tory even stronger, strong mayor powers, giving him the ability to pass votes with only one third of council support. This is an undemocratic, backroom deal that this government has been hiding from Ontarians. Speaker, why didn't the Premier tell people during the recent election campaign that he'd be undermining democracy as part of his program? Yeah. Mr. Mr. Terry, some housing. You know, Speaker, the, the Premier has been on record. Uh, in fact, it was in, in his book uh, of his interest in the strong mayor system. When we tabled this bill, uh, the uh, Strong Mayors Building Homes Act, almost immediately upon Order. the election, we made it very clear that we were going to put a plan in place, not just to uh, give the Mayor of Toronto and Ottawa with Strong Mayor Proud, but the Premier was extremely transparent in communicating that we were going to continue uh, that opportunity to other regions. We, you know, Bill 39, uh, that's uh, the, the Better Municipal Governance Act, is on the floor uh, for debate in the Legislative Assembly. It provides exactly what the Premier promised, and that is to extend uh, these powers to other regions in the province, and as well, in Response. the spirit of collaboration, we're acting on the suggestion that Mayor Tory put forward and putting it in this bill so that he has tools to get shovels in the ground faster. We're in the middle of a housing crisis. I, I, you know, I, I, hate, I hate to keep reminding. Thank you. Speaker, the Premier is using Bill 39 to allow the Mayor of Toronto to pass laws at City Hall with the support of only one third of Council. The mayor could pass laws with the support of just eight members out of 25. We operate in a democracy, 50% plus one, majority rule. But this bill silences two-thirds of council. It silences the voice of the majority of Torontonians and how our city is run. Will the premier abide by the democratic process and withdraw this absurd bill? Mr. Mr. Affairs and Housing. Speaker, I want to remind the uh, House that uh, we're in the middle of a housing crisis. We, our best year in 30 years was last year when we had over 100,000 starts. New Democrats this morning in debate of Bill 23 acknowledged the 1.5 million homes that are needed in Ontario over the next decade. The status quo does not work. Here, here. The fact that our government is advancing the strong mayor powers over and above Toronto and Ottawa is not something that the Premier has hidden in any way, in any shape or any form. We need to ensure that mayors across the province have all the tools that they need to get shovels in the ground faster. We need to ensure that we have a plan Order. in place to build those 1.5 million homes, and we're going to continue with our agenda as we work with our municipal partners. And the final Speaker, we learned that the Mayor of Toronto and the Premier were having these backroom conversations as far back as this summer. This is how the government operates, secret conversations behind closed doors. We saw that with the cuts to the Green Belt. Backdoor meetings led to results for wealthy donor developers at the expense of the interests of the people of Ontario. Will the Premier stop his backroom deals with donors and serve in the interest of the public? 
Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, we had a meeting with Ontario's big city mayors and regional chairs in January. The Premier and I were crystal clear that the status quo is not working and we need to put more plans in place, whether they be legislative or regulatory, to get shovels in the ground faster. What, what did mayors say back to us? They said very clearly that we needed to put a plan in place on the, in the legislature. We needed to change laws. We needed to provide regulatory opportunities to get shovels in the ground faster. It takes way too Order. long to get housing built in Ontario. The costs and the fees are adding significant Order. dollars. We're placing a generation of Ontarians out of the market, and I'm not going to stand here yeah. and not make those changes. We start the clock. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, again to the Premier. Speaker, the Public Order Emergency Commission published an email yesterday detailing a conversation between the Premier and Public Safety Minister Marco Mendocino on Wednesday, February 9th. During the call, the Premier said that Dr. Moore would announce the end of vaccine passports on Thursday, and on Friday, the Premier himself would announce the end of mandates. Coincidentally, Mr. Speaker, it was at this exact same time the Premier was alleged to have been speaking with convoy leaders, vowing to, quote, pull these passports and telling convoy leaders he would be making an announcement on Friday. Will the Premier finally admit today that he was speaking to both the federal government officials and convoy leaders during the occupation of Ottawa? Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, look, I think uh, the, the, what uh, the member is referring to is the, uh, the federal commission into the federal government's use of the, uh, of the, of the Emergencies Act. Uh, and we have been working, uh, of course, uh, uh, with the, we have been working with the commission, as I've said on, uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly uh, uh, glad that the member opposite, though, highlights the, the very good work of health care professionals across the province of Ontario throughout the last year to get us in a position in the province of Ontario where we were able to remove some of the mandates uh, uh, that helped us so much in getting us to the position where we're at today. But part of that, of course, goes to the Minister of Health, the good people uh, who work in that in that area, who who undertook one of the largest vaccine rollouts in the history of this country, uh, Mr. Speaker. Some. Uh, but I think it's over 90% of Ontarians who have got their first and their second uh, dose. So the member is quite correct. We were working to remove mandates as quickly as we possibly can, always putting the people of the province first, putting the health and safety of, the, of Ontarians first. But it's because of the investments that we made we were able to remove those mandates. And I'm very, very happy that the member opposite recognizes that good hard work. Great. Great. Again to the Premier, the email released yesterday by the Commission showed that the Premier was willing to exert pressure on the Prime Minister to end federal government mandates. In February, the Premier had no issue putting pressure on the federal government, but when he's trying to avoid testifying and being accountable to the public, he has no issue with hiding behind jurisdiction. Will the Premier tell the people of this province who and what he is hiding from? Government House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, a curious question, given the fact that we actually had a select committee here that met on a monthly basis to talk about the Ontario's imposition of a state of emergency here, right? And in that committee, it was made up of the members opposite who were able to question uh, uh, representatives of the government, the health minister, I know the solicitor general was there. Uh, on, op on many occasions. We actually had two debates in this House, Mr. Speaker, on when the, those uh, states of emergency in the province of Ontario ended. And on both occasions, Speaker, although we had set aside four hours assuming the opposition wanted to talk about it, on both occasions, debate collapsed after I think only about an hour on one, an hour and a half on the other, because the opposition had had enough, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that we work Fox? very hard to keep the people of the province of Ontario safe. The people of the province of Ontario deserve all of the credit for that, Mr. Speaker, as do our frontline health care workers who, who brought the next question, the member for Barry Innisfil. Uh, thank you, Speaker. 
anti-Semitism has no place anywhere here in Ontario. This chamber must be united in condemning anti-Semitism. Those words must not be hollow. When anti-Semitism is left unchallenged, they have a direct consequence for the safety of the Jewish community, not only here in Ontario, but across Canada. According to Recent Statistics Canada data, Jewish Canadians continue to be the most targeted religious group of hate crimes in this country. We must not allow that hatred to be fueled, especially by individuals in power and responsibility. There must be consequences for anti-Semitic anti behavior. And I understand words matter, but actions matter more. So I'd like to know what our government is doing to stand up and combat anti-Semitism. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, hate in all forms has no place in Ontario. And to be clear, this includes anti-Semitism. We will not let anti-Semitism disrupt our way of life, especially here in Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, this is very personal to me. And I'm proud to serve a Premier in a government who views our diversity as our greatest strength. The proof of our the proof the proof of our diversity is right here. All those who sit around me in our party working together. So what can we do? We can call it out. Anti-Semitism is toxic to our democracy. And when we combat anti-Semitism, we protect our human rights and our human dignity for all. And we protect our common values in our communities. And it doesn't matter where we come from or how we got here. It's about doing the right thing and calling out hatred for what it is. It has no place in Ontario, and we will not tolerate it. Here, here. Stop the Start the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. All members of this House must show leadership by directly addressing anti Semitism, no matter where it is found or who is making the statements. While some in this House, like the member for Ottawa Centre, may not believe actions must be taken, we disagree. On this side of the House, our government has a strong record on combating anti Semitism by introducing things like Holocaust education in our school system as young as the age of grade six. But let's be clear more needs to be done. And as we continue to invest resources to combat all forms of hate, we cannot allow for the normalization of anti-Semitism to take place in Ontario. We cannot take a casual approach, and we all have a responsibility to act. So I'd like to ask the Minister, the Solicitor General, how are we freeing Ontario of anti-Semitism? Mr. Speaker, let me be absolutely clear. The hate that begins with anti-Semitism never ends with anti-Semitism. And we make a great mistake if we think anti-Semitism is only about the Jewish community. It's about anti-Semites. It's about people that cannot accept a community of tolerance and instead have to blame someone else for their own problems. This is categorically wrong and not part of the values of who we are in Ontario. We've invested over $25 million to protect against hate-motivated violence, racism, and hate. And just two weeks ago, I was proud to be with our Minister of Education and our caucus members at an important announcement of mandatory Holocaust education in grade six curriculum, commencing for the first time next year. Mr. Speaker, some things have to matter. The rule of law, our ability to live safely in our own communities, one to another, free of hate and discrimination. Mr. Speaker, this must matter. You're here. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ontario's child welfare system takes children and youth into their care who have experienced abuse, have complex mental health needs, or are orphaned. Cassidy Frank was one of those kids. She was sent to a for-profit group home in Hamilton run by Hats Off, the second largest operator of youth group homes in Ontario. 
It was there that Cassidy witnessed harsh physical abuse, awful food, and horrific conditions. When the opportunity to live with a Hats Off staff member arose, Cassidy jumped at the opportunity, hoping for an escape. But weeks later, she was removed by Hamilton Police Service's Human Trafficking Division. Tragically, Cassidy was not alone in her experience. A months-long investigation into Hats Off homes found that allegations of human trafficking went ignored, staff were extremely unqualified, children were being over-medicated and physically restrained at disproportionate high rates. Speaker, why is this government sending children and youth like Cassidy to live in abusive conditions? Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. This scenario is horrific, and our government is absolutely committed to making sure that we leave no room, no room, in our system for providers who are not operating in compliance with the requirements set out. No room. Yeah. Our aim is for families and communities to be strengthened and supported through preventative services and early intervention, and that's why we are implementing a redesign for the child welfare system in Ontario. We acknowledge that there's issues, and there's been long-standing issues, and we're the government that is taking action to address this issue in so many ways. To improve the oversight of licensees, we've added 20 new staff to support enhanced inspections of the children's residential services system. Since January 2022, we've boosted the number of inspections at licensed group homes. We're improving data collection and measurement tools to improve service, Response. and we're backing that up with investments. Our priority is to make sure that every individual, child and youth, has a safe and loving home. We'll continue to make these important changes, continue to back it up with investments. This is important to our government. And we're Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Minister, Speaker, to the Minister, you have been in government for four and a half years while these kids have lived in conditions where there were bedbugs and rodents, where they were being abused and starved and trafficked and over-medicated. It's your responsibility. Stop trying to abdicate. Speaker, every day this government doesn't implement and enforce Order. stronger child welfare rules is another day a child Order. is subject to abuse within a system that is supposed to protect them. Right. Global News obtained a secret government draft report flagging the issues at Hats Off years ago. Oh, wow. Some of the devastating allegations include a staff member holding a girl on the floor over pieces of broken glass and another spitting, a child, spitting in a child's face as he was restrained. Will this government finally take responsibility for the kids in their care, investigate hats off, and take action so that no Question. child spends another day, another minute, in these horrific conditions? Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services to reply. Thank you, Speaker. I outright reject the premise of the question from the, from the opposition, insinuating that action has Order. not been taken. Action is being taken, and unfortunately, after years of neglect by the previous opposition, uh, supported by, by the NDP, we have a situation that we are dealing with, and we'll continue to deal with it. So let me be clear and state again, there is no room for, in our system for providers who refuse to provide the quality care that's necessary. Uh, this is horrific. Come to order. In the history of the child welfare system, we know that there are very hardworking people trying to make this better, but the issues that you mention exist. And that's why we're, we're addressing the inspections. It's why we're improving uh, inspections. It's why we're improving oversight. It's why we're improving the data collection. It's why we're improving public transparency. It's why we're making sure that the measures that are needed to address this issue Response. are being implemented. We'll continue this very, very important work. And I thank the member for her question. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. My riding of Brantford Brant is home to some of our province's most notable manufacturing operations, many of which are multinational companies. These companies positively impact my local community, where they operate and contribute to our province's diverse and growing manufacturing sector. But to remain competitive, businesses must be assured that our government will continue fostering the right environment for their continued growth. 
Speaker, will the minister please explain how our government supports manufacturers and businesses who are helping to deliver good-paying jobs for the people of Brantford? Thank you. Thank you. Of economic development, job creation, and trade. Brantford is a manufacturing powerhouse and one of the most competitive places to do business, and that is why global companies continue to invest and grow there. Ferraro Canada is investing $44 million in Brantford. This sweet project will increase production capacity to help meet the growing demand for some of the world's most favourite products. It will create 124 well-paying jobs, which is why we invested $1.5 million through our Southwestern Development Fund. Speaker, in total, this program has created over 1,300 jobs and attracted over $736 million in investments, with much more in the pipeline. Speaker, this is our commitment to the people of Brantford and to families in Ontario. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answer. There is no doubt that initiatives like the Regional Development Program help support businesses that continue to power our province's economy. I am proud that a distinguished company like Ferrero continues to make large-scale investments and is expanding its operation right here in my community of Brantford. While it is positive that our Open for Business strategy continues to attract global manufacturers, we must also ensure that conditions are right for entrepreneurs to continue to succeed right here at home. Our entrepreneurs and small business leaders employ thousands in Brantford and help to keep Ontario's economy competitive. Speaker, will the minister please share how our government supports entrepreneurs as they start and grow their local businesses? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, for 15 long years, Liberal and NDP policies sent business and investments fleeing from Ontario, but our government, Speaker, has reversed all of that. We lowered the cost of doing business by $7 billion every year, and we now support a network of regional innovation centres and small business centres. In fact, we provide Brantford's small business center with close to half a million dollars every year. And we support their summer company and their starter company plus programs with over $85,000 annually to help young entrepreneurs get their businesses off the ground. And a further $35,000 was invested this year in digital transformation grants, and that helped local Brantford businesses put their businesses online. Speaker, the dream of entrepreneurship is once again within reach of thousands of families in Brantford Lance. and all across Ontario. The next question, the member for London North Centre. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, Bill 23 does not create the safe, affordable homes that people need. Bill 23 will cost the City of London's taxpayers $97 million, Whoa. while wealthy developers laugh all the way to the bank. AMO showed this bill will let private developers run away from a billion-dollar tab, a tab paid for by everyone else. Will this government listen to the chorus of Ontarians and municipalities opposed to Bill 23 and stop squeezing the little guy? Affairs and housing. Speaker, um, you know, the NDP would like to add $116,000 to the cost of a home by defending the status quo. You know, my question back to them is, have you learned nothing from the last election? You're actually, you know, supporting adding cost to the system, making it harder for young families to realize the dream of home ownership. So that's the contrast, Speaker. The NDP are always going to stand up for increased cost. The, on this side of the House, we want to give Ontarians a yeah, break. Yeah. We want to ensure that we reduce the cost of housing so that Ontarians can realize the dream of home ownership. Supplementary question. Back to the Premier. A newsflash for the Minister. After four years, this government is the status quo, and they need to actually build affordable housing, right, not right, leave it up right. to the private industry. My constituent Sandra wrote, Bill 23 will strip democratically elected municipal governments the ability and tools to ensure that growth and development will indeed pay for itself. It does not pay for maintenance. This financial black hole will grow exponentially if Bill 23 becomes law. Bill 23 destroys development charges, which the city uses to create more affordable housing. Yeah. 
Bill 23 stops City Council from creating affordable housing. How will this government make up the difference? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Yeah, the, the most significant proposed changes to development charges are for affordable and non-profit housing and exclusionary zoning, everything that our government wants to incent. But, you know, the member doesn't have to take my word for it. You know, take the word of Simone Swale, the manager of government relations for the Co-op Housing Federation of Canada, who's here at Queen's Park today. The commitment to waive development charges for all affordable housing developments will have a tangible and positive impact on the ability to develop new affordable co-ops in Ontario. We also look forward to engaging with the province in order to reduce the property tax burden on affordable housing providers, including co-ops. Don't take my word for it. Take it from the here, CHF. Here. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The number one cost of climate change to ordinary people is the cost of flooding. Flooded basements, flooded businesses. The Flood Hazard Identification and Mapping Program, a federal program which operates through the province, closed applications on September the 16th. Applications were evaluated on, based on planned development, uh, but with Bill 23, plans have suddenly changed. The Conservatives now want to develop the Green Belt. A new section in the Ontario Wetlands Evaluation System means wetlands and wetland complexes can be re-evaluated and developed. Okay. Climate change always redefined what weather conditions are care to look ahead, there are new areas which will be a high priority for floodplain and flood hazard mapping. What plans has the government made and what funds have been set aside for new floodplain and flood hazard mapping? Mr. Nuts Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I am proud to say that this government is keeping Ontarians safe, making sure that people and property are protected, working with conservation authorities to make sure that they are focused on that key mandate, making sure that we are building new homes in Ontario as we do all this. 1.5 million new homes over the next 10 years. Homes for seniors, homes for students, homes for people that are coming to this province for the very first time. If all this is wrong, Mr. Speaker. If doing all this is wrong and building all these homes and keeping people safe and keeping property safe is wrong, I don't want to be right. <laughs> Supplementary question. Well, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to flooding, the Conservatives are saying, build now, worry about water later. Suppose your wetland evaluation is missing information about hydrological functions. Well, the Conservatives deleted that section of the Ontario Wetlands Evaluation System, which tells you what to do. Now it's advanced to go collect $200. If wetlands are re-evaluated and developed, if trees are cut, fields are paved over, then flood hazard maps will change. This has a real impact on family budgets. Is this government prepared for families who have to pay more for flood insurance or lose insurance altogether? Le nouveau système d'évaluation des terres. This new system of wetlands in Ontario and of this conservative government put aside the role of the experts. Can we trust them? Can we make sure that wetlands assessment is made? People of Ontario well will people of Ontario have access to all the results? The Minister of Natural Resources answered that question, the first part of that question, perfectly. But again, I want to put into perspective uh, what the Liberal Party is proposing by defending the status quo. And I want to go back to that $116,900 uh, of cost that is going to be added on the, uh, on the home in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. So at current interest rates of 5.69%, is going to add an additional $812 on a home buyer's monthly mortgage over 20 years. So that's the cost of a down payment. So you either stand with us to be able to put a plan in place on a number that you, none of you have, have argued about. All of you have acknowledged that you're, you're in action over the last 15 Senate years. Senate members come to order. They acknowledge their inaction because they acknowledge that we need to build 1.5 million homes over the next 10 years. So they acknowledge Lots. that they did nothing on this file, <laughs> and now they stand in the way of young families and want to add an additional $812 per month. 
Thank you. The next question, the member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government believes that the mining industry is essential to our province's economic strength and helps ensure our northern community's prosperity. This industry serves a critical role in helping our province deliver on our vision of creating a supply chain for electric vehicles. Because our government has created the right conditions for ongoing investments, mining operations continue to expand while ensuring both sustainability and respect for environmental interests. The communities in the north, local First Nations and our economy all reap the benefits when mining companies continue to invest and to grow. Speaker, could the Minister of Mines please provide an example of how our government's leadership and support for the mining industry contributes to positive outcomes for northern communities? Thank you. Minister of Mines. Thank you for the question from the member from Sault Ste. Marie. The mining industry in Ontario is the best in the world, but that hasn't stopped us from improving. Last week, the Premier was back in Timmins to join me at Newmont's announcement of a $160 million investment in a new state-of-the-art effluent, effluent treatment plant. This new industry-leading plant will return treated clean water to the watershed, benefiting the eco ecosystem for generations. The treatment plant will secure the future of Newmont's operations in my hometown of Porcupine. Mr. Speaker, a mining operation like this is part of the fabric of our community and creates prosperity for the people of Timmins and for the entire province. Ontario has and will continue to lead the world in environmentally Response. responsibly mining. Supplementary question. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much to the Minister for your response. Unfortunately, the previous Liberal government did not value the mining industry and the importance of critical minerals, which delayed economic growth for the North for many years. Our government continues demonstrating much-needed leadership in our strategies and actions to build relationships with the North and strengthen its economic potential. Our government's critical mineral strategy creates the right conditions for investment, and success is currently being realized in this vital sector. Speaker, could the minister please provide further information about how recent investments by the mining industry benefits all Ontarians, especially those residing in the north? Mr. Mine. Thank you again for your question. Mr. Speaker, the mining industry in Ontario is thriving, and we are just getting started. Last month, the Premier and I were at the official opening of Valley's $945 million complex at, at Coppercliff. This will create 270 jobs in the Sudbury region and lead to 14 years of production. The company is also preparing to invest another billion dollars in phase two of the project. Great news. We have mines under construction right now, including Argonauts, Gold, uh, Argonaut Gold's Maginot Project, the Greenstone Gold Mine, and IM Gold's Cote Lake Project. These new mines are creating thousands of construction jobs, but more importantly, they will build a stronger communities throughout the North. Mr. Speaker, we have Spons. more work to do, but we are building the foundation for the future of mining, and that will bring unprecedented pros pros prosperity to this province. Next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you. To the Premier, during the recent Toronto election, the Premier and Mayor Tory made a secret deal so that Mayor Tory would be able to govern the city with only one third of city councillors. That's eight out of the 25 who were elected. So my, I've been wondering, if you're going to override democratic majority rule, why one third? Why not one quarter or one sixth or one tenth? And so I looked, did some research, and of the recently elected 25 councillors in Toronto, Mayor Tory endorsed seven, and Premier Ford endorsed two. That makes nine, one third plus one. So my question is, did the Premier look at the results of the Toronto election and then decide that a one third minority would allow the Mayor, Mayor Tory to govern the city with the votes of only their endorsed candidates? Mr.
Uh, well, I want to thank the member for Humber River Black Creek for the question. I'm glad he brought up elections because I'm glad that uh, that he and and Niagara Falls and Kowatnong are still in the race for NDP uh, leader. You know, in, in fact, the member opposite mentioned that he's still kicking the tires. Okay. Well, I got news for you, man. It, you keep with these policies, the wheels have fallen off during the election. There's no more tires to kick. You need to stand up for realizing the dream of home ownership. You need to support municipalities like Mayor Tory, who have asked for new tools. And you need to understand that this kind of status quoism is adding over $100,000 to the price of a new home in Toronto. Yeah, yeah. You're literally putting a generation of Ontarians out of home ownership because of your failed policies. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the House. Supplementary question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Back to the Premier. Toronto elected 25 city councillors, but under Bill 39, only eight plus the mayor will make decisions, effectively silencing 17 councillors and the communities they represent. Toronto's council is the most diverse in its history, with 27% of councillors being racialized. This is a step in the right direction, but still a far cry from Toronto's full diversity, where 55% of folks here are visibly racialized. But now, because of the Premier's secret deal with Mayor Tory, their voices would be silenced through this bill's minority rule. My question is to the Premier. When progressive women and BIPOC city councillors achieve historic elections in city council, the government changes the rules and strips them and the voters who elected them of their power. Will this government withdraw their dangerous, undemocratic Question. and inequitable Bill 39 and actually allow racialized Torontonians, all Torontonians, to have power at city councillor with the councillor they elected? Thank you. Order. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I want to apologize to the member for Spadina, Fort York, for mischaracterizing his, his riding. But I am excited that there is finally some interest in the democratic leadership in, in Ontario. You know, the member opposite who just asked that question from, uh, from St. Paul's actually said in this House that building more housing won't solve our problem, uh, which I can't believe that she would actually put that in Hansard and I would actually Order. elect it. You know who I'm standing up for? We're going to have over half a million new Canadians Order. that come to Ontario. You can, you can go like this to me all you want, but the fact of the matter is you know, we've, we've got a, 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 an immigration increase that's going to happen. 60% of them are going to come to Ontario. On this side of the house, we want to welcome them, but we also want to have, and on this side of the house too, I, I see the group right here. This side of the house too. So, on both sides of the house, uh, we we agree that we want to welcome uh, new Canadians who are probably we got the best province uh, in the country to live and to work and to raise a family. We want to have enough. Thank you. The next question, the member for Sobico Lakeshore. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. And first of all, I want to thank the Minister for coming to Etobicoke Lakeshore and touring the William F. White Movie Production and Business Centre in the great riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore. Great riding, great riding. This company equips Ontario and Canada's film and television industry with the most extensive and technological advanced rent, retail and rental inventory in the country. William F. White is a tremendous success story that contributes to our economy and provides great paying jobs to thousands of people across the problem, province and right in my riding of Etobicoke. But with other jurisdictions battling Ontario to bring film and TV to their respective areas, Ontario needs to do more to keep such a vital industry and the many jobs created right here. Speaker, can the minister please share with us what the government is doing to encourage and to cultivate the expansion of on-screen based industries in Ontario? Good question. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> go Canada. Um, <laughs> I'd like to thank the member for Mississauga Lakeshore for the question and for joining me with, in that meeting. Oh, I'm sorry, hold it. Mississauga, Etobicoke. No wonder I missed the first meeting. Um, <laughs> as well as joining me in that very important meeting and all the work that you do in your community in helping the rest of Ontarians. 
Uh, from meetings and conversations I've had with stakeholders in the area among a diverse region, it's evident that the sector has a footprint across our province, whether it's in Toronto, London, Hamilton, or the North, North Bay. Film and television is thriving across Ontario. Last year, we had our highest economic activity Response. to date, with almost 400 productions bringing in close to $3 billion oh in my. spending wow. and almost 50,000 jobs. $3 billion and 50,000 jobs. We're going to expand on that. This province and our premier wants to build on this industry. Ontario is a great place to do business and a great place to showcase. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. Uh, you know, seeing local landmarks in film or SIPCOM can undoubtedly spark a strong sense of pride from the community being so showcased. And I know when we watch our movies, sometimes we see little pieces and snippets from our community, or I know the northern communities have a lot of uh, film business there as well, but we still want them to come to Etobicoke. <laughs> <laughs> Ontario's film and television industry faces increased competition from outside production companies in national and global markets. Speaker, our government must step up and provide leadership in supporting our film and culture television industries as they compete with other jurisdictions that have taken significant and strong measures to en enhance their landmark attractions. And we want to keep those jobs right here in Ontario. Speaker, can the minister explain what our government is doing to give Ontario domestic industry a leading edge over the competition? And I must say, go Team Canada. Here we go. All right. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I agree with the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore. All right, got that right. Um, and that's why we'll never stop working. We'll never stop working for the people in Ontario. We will continue to build on our success, and that's key. We have we have just expanded the Ontario Production Services tax credit to include location fees to help attract domestic and foreign film and television, and encourage more on-location filming in communities across our great province. This means you'll be able to see more of Ontario on TV. Never a bad thing. Further, as more and more productions are geared towards platforms like Netflix, Amazon Prime and Disney Plus, we're keeping up with the changing times and viewing habits by modernizing our tax credit to include productions that are distributed exclusively online. We want the world to know what a great place Ontario it is, what a great place it is to do business in Ontario, and our Premier holds behind that statement as we do behind him. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I want to read two recent headlines within the last 24 hours. Headline number one, Doug Ford is looking to cut costs in health care spending, documents show. Second headline, child with pneumonia waits 40 hours in Ontario ER. Speaker, a health care system is on the verge of collapse. There are no available beds for children, not even children. Why is the government cutting even more funding when every Ontarian is crying and asking you to do what it takes to solve the health care crisis? I'm going to remind the member that we refer to other members by their ministerial title or their writing as, as applicable, not by their name. Minister of Health. You know, when we talk about investments in the healthcare system, we are talking about true dollars in terms of our most recent budget, of course, in August, which this member opposite chose not to support. We invested an additional $5 billion in our health care system. We have already added 3,500 new hospital beds in the province of Ontario. We will continue to work with all of our partners in hospital, in primary care, in public health units. But let me assure the member opposite and the people of Ontario that our government is making the investments that, bluntly, the Liberal government and the NDP government before did not do. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Speaker. My question is again to the Premier. I recently heard from my constituent, Derek, who told me, I work as a pediatric emergency nurse at Sick Kids Hospital. I love my job, he says, and I do this even before the pandemic, and I would be paid a reasonable wage if I could and live in this city. I will work until my body tells me not to. The HR and nursing shortage cannot be solved quickly. 
Short-term action is of the utmost importance. Improving nursing compensation is the best thing we can do to actually improve retention. This government has been in power for almost five years, enough time to solve just about any problem. Will this government admit that Bill 124 is driving the remaining number of nurses out of the province? Thank you. Mr. Health. You know, I, I respectfully have to disagree. There are some things that we have done and can do quickly. One of those things is through the College of Nurses of Ontario, directing them to say when people have applied who are internationally trained, get those assessments done and get them into the system quickly. We've seen that. Historic numbers are already practicing in their province. You know, the member opposite talked about sick kids, uh, pediatric nurse. Absolutely incredible work that sick kids are doing. You know what they're doing right now? They're training. Those sick kids nurses are training other community health nurses. Sick kid doctors are training and explaining how to deal with RSV so that community hospitals will have that same depth of experience and care and compassion that we see every single day in our hospitals across Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Tarleton. Merci, Monsieur le Président. My question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Francophone Affairs. Promoting Francophony, Ontario and Francophony beyond our borders is important to promote relations with other Francophone areas. The we are part of the International Association of Francophony since 2016. The minister was in the Francophony Summit. Can the minister explain how adding Ontario to this organization will have benefits in the economic growth of Ontario? Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for my colleague to, for her question. Adding Ontario to the international organization of Francophony as an observant member is one of the priorities for a government. It's a strategy for, such as the strategy for developing francophone services. This allows us to strengthen our francophony in the international scene, to make our post-secondary institutions be well known in the world. And Ontario is engaged to strengthen the role of francophony in our world, in our country, and in the world, and I'm proud to have been able to represent Ontario in these organizations and to create relationships with francophones all over the world. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for to the minister for her reply. Franco Ontario have a rich history in our province, and our government has made significant investments to promote francophonia within the education system, which is why I'm thrilled to hear about the initiatives to promote Ontarian francophonia at a world-class level. Can the minister tell us more about Ontario's participation on the Francophone Economic Phone Forum? Thank you. Speaker, the topic of the Economic Forum of the International Organization of Organ was to have a shared space for Ontario Francophony. Boreal College, the Francophone Centre of Toronto, have shown that Ontario was able to profit from these bilateral meetings. Ontario's participation in this forum gives our province the chance to explore relationships that will allow international collaboration and to promote the economy of the province. Actually, it's because of this trip that Ontario was able to sign an understanding ag agreement with Brussels. This speaker is something, it's the uh, first of in kind in terms of francophony. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Today, we will be debating my bill. Healthcare is not for sale, which, if passed, would ensure that none of our province private for-profit health clinics charge patients unfair 
or illegal fees. Minister, Canadian Doctors for Medicare, Canadian Medical Associations, the Auditor Generals of Ontario, uh, Ontario Health Coalition, all have documented proof that shows that Ontario has ineffective oversight of private for-profit clinics. Minister, will your government support my bill to ensure that no patient in this province is charged on fair fees? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and I look forward to this afternoon's debate. Certainly wouldn't want to presuppose the outcome, but I will say to the member opposite that we have a process in place when, uh, for any number of reasons, an inappropriate billing takes place. There is a process where we regularly uh, review and uh, refund when appropriate if those fees have happened. Um, <laughs> frankly, it is a very small percentage of practitioners who, as I say, for any number of reasons, may have um, put in a billing that was inappropriate for the time. We assess those within the ministry, and ultimately we do refund the uh, patients when that happens on those very rare occasions. As I said, I'm not going to presuppose this afternoon's debate and look forward to it. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Many reports on private for-profit delivery of health care services in our province shows what happened with the inadequate oversight that we have right here, right now in Ontario. Patients are first forced to pay for unnecessary tests, for add-on. They are forced to pay hundreds of dollars just in order to be able to gain access to OHIP cover services. Many reliable sources tell us that the oversight we have in place is not effective. Will the minister support my bill to protect patients against unfair fees charged by private for-profit clinics? Thank you, Speaker. Respectfully, I believe that the member is attempting to find a problem where there isn't one. What I hear from the people of Ontario is how do we make sure that we have a publicly funded health care system that continues to provide exceptional care to the people of Ontario? How do we make sure that those individuals who perhaps do not have to have that operation in the hospital, example, cataract surgery, can do that seamlessly in their own community? We'll continue to do that work. We'll continue to uh, find those innovative solutions that will make sure that surgery backlogs, when they occur, are able to ultimately be dealt with in an appropriate manner using your OHIP card. Thank you. Next question, the member for Oxford. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. With the cost of many essential items remaining too high, the issue of affordability is a significant concern for many of my constituents, especially seniors on fixed incomes. They're worried about the rising cost due to global inflation. For our most vulnerable, food cost inflation can have a detrimental impact on what they are able to buy. The impact of high prices on essential food items is felt first and hardest by the most vulnerable, including low-income seniors. Speaker, could the minister please explain how our government plans to ensure financial support for our seniors who are most in need? Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you to the member for asking such an important question and for all the marvelous work you are doing for your riding of Oxford. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we are helping seniors by proposing to double the guaranteed annual income system in 2023. This will now provide $166 per month, $1,992 per year, directly into the pockets of our seniors most in need. Our government stands with our seniors. And on behalf of all seniors, I want to thank the Premier and the Minister of Finance for their leadership in providing the kind of financial support Thoughts? our senior needs. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, and thank the minister for his response. Aside from financial challenges, research shows that approximately 30 per cent of Canadian seniors are at risk of becoming socially isolated. Social isolation can lead to serious adverse health effects and reduce quality of life for our seniors. We must protect our seniors and support them in continuing and expanding their participation in our society. Speaker, can the minister please tell us how our government is helping our seniors in Ontario stay active, healthy, and socially connected in their communities? Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Well, that's a good question. As I mentioned, our government is proposing to give close to a, an extra $1,000 per year to support seniors in need. We have also invested almost $22 million in over 1,200 senior community grants since 2012. We also fund 299 senior active living centers all across the province. Many of the programs we fund offer both in-person and virtual option. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our government will continue to work with the local partners all across Ontario. When we work together, we can ensure that what? seniors can access the quality program and service they need and deserve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. We have a deferred vote on a motion for closure on the motion for second reading of Bill 39, an act to amend the City of Toronto Act 2006 and the Municipal Act 2001, and to enact the Duffins Rouge Agriculture Preserve Repeal Act 2022. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.